Hi there, this is Matt Heffernan, welcome back to my channel. This is the ninth episode of my tutorial series on Z80 assembly language development, targeting the Sinclair ZX Spectrum to learn how to program a simple system starting at the very lowest level. If you haven't seen the earlier episodes, I strongly encourage you to go back to my channel and don't forget to subscribe and click the bell to be notified when the next episode comes out and start this playlist from the beginning. So far in this series, we have learned the basics of assembly language and instructions from each of the main categories, but that leaves a few behind that don't quite fit into any of those subsets. In this episode, we are going to go over all the instructions we haven't covered yet. Going through the entire tutorial series through this episode, we should have a good understanding of the complete range of the Z80 instruction set and how we can apply it for the specific purposes that will be covered in future episodes. Let's start with an instruction that does nothing. NOP, which is generally pronounced NOOP because it stands for no operation, is the Z80 instruction for opcode 0. No state of the CPU will change except for the program counter moving on to the next instruction, and four T states will elapse in the process. This means that a single NOOP will cause a delay of just over a microsecond for a 3.5 MHz Z80, like in the original Speccy. This can be helpful when dealing with the hardware interfaces that need to have short delays between operations to wait for state changes. If you really want to put your hacker hat on, you can have self-modifying code that effectively erases instructions by replacing them with zeros in RAM so they won't be executed anymore. There are many different use cases for NOOPs, and we'll explore some of them in later episodes. If you are coming to Z80 development from a different architecture, you may have already noticed that there is no flag for decimal mode or any arithmetic instructions that operate on binary coded decimal, or BCD values. That means any time you do an add or subtract instruction, the operation will be done assuming the operand values are binary. But if you want to encode a value as BCD to make it easier to interface with the display or keyboard, or even just convert a value to decimal, the Z80 has you covered with the DAA, or Decimal Adjust Accumulator instruction. It assumes that the accumulator value and flags have not changed since the last arithmetic instruction, and it will adjust the value in A to have the correct BCD result. For a value to be valid BCD, each nibble has to have a value between 0 and 9, so that when you print it in hex, it looks like a decimal number with no letters in it. If two BCD values are added or subtracted as binary, the result may not be the correct BCD value, so a DAA will fix that. If the lower nibble is greater than 9, or the H bit is set, it will add 6 to the accumulator which will cause a carry into the upper nibble and make the lower nibble the correct decimal numeral. Then, if the upper nibble is now greater than 9, it will add hex 60 to adjust that to the current decimal numeral as well, and set the carry bit. If the upper nibble didn't need to be adjusted, the carry bit is cleared. It seems a bit like black magic, but it works, and we'll see how in our example program later. With the Z80, you don't have to implement your own linear search algorithm, it's already built into the instruction set. While it's not the most efficient search method, it's often all you need, and sometimes the only way to do it. The CPI instruction implements a single iteration of a forward linear search, and effectively performs three instructions. Compare A to HL indirect, then increment HL, and decrement BC. The main way it differs from these instructions, apart from being faster and taking up less code memory, is the state of the flags after it is executed. If the value in A was equal to the value at the address in HL before the increment, then the Z bit is set. If the decrement of BC caused an overflow, then the PV bit is set. Also, the N bit is always set and the carry bit is preserved. This means you can keep executing CPIs until either of the Z or PV bits are set, and it will do a forward search through memory starting at the initial address in HL for a number of iterations specified in BC. However, that overflow won't happen until BC is decremented from zero, so the maximum number of iterations will be the initial value in BC minus one. Also, if the matching value is found, the address in HL is now one byte past it, as the compare was done before the increment. If you need to do a backward search instead, you can use the CPD instruction to do a compare and decrement. It works the same as CPI, except that HL is decremented. 
This means that if the value is found, then the Z bit is set and the address in HL is one byte behind it. Just like CPI, CPD is only really useful in a loop. And luckily, you don't have to implement the branching logic for it if all you're doing each iteration is just that one instruction. CPIR will do a CPI and repeat until that Z bit is set from a successful comparison or BC gets down to zero. If Z is not set after executing CPIR, then you know that the value was not found in the specified range, specified by HL for the starting address, and BC for the number of bytes to search going forward. While you don't need to check for overflow, you do need to adjust the address in HL by decrementing it afterwards, if you want to have the address of the found value, rather than the next one. Also, just as with similar instructions like LDIR, the amount of time it takes to execute this instruction can vary wildly depending on the value loaded into BC and the contents of memory. If you want to search the entire memory space, then you can load 0 into BC and it will keep going until the value is found somewhere. Of course, this will not search any memory banks that aren't currently mapped in, so searching across banks will require doing multiple CPIRs and switching banks between them. CPDR, unsurprisingly, will do a CPD and repeat until the value is found or BC is decremented to zero. Just as with CPIR, HL will be one off the target value if the Z bit was set, and you will have to increment it to get the target address. We'll see how both CPIR and CPDR work later in the example program. While we aren't going into depth on interrupts until a later episode, we will just quickly go through the instructions right now. First up is IM, which sets the current maskable interrupt mode. The Z80 supports three different interrupt modes, numbered 0, 1, and 2, which is used as the only operand. The original Spectrum doesn't support IM0, so you never want to do that unless you have some specially modified system. By default, the Spectrum ROM boots you into IM1, which means that maskable interrupts always trigger the routine at restart vector hex 38, which is also in the ROM. If you want to use this built-in routine, just keep it in this mode, or return to it after you're done using the other mode. That would be IM2, which lets you set your own interrupt vector, which could be in RAM or anywhere in the memory map. This is where the I register comes in, which you can use to set the page of memory where your interrupt jump table will be stored. The lower byte of the address in this table will be set at the time of the interrupt with the value on the data bus. How that actually works is a bit confusing, so we'll come back to that in the interrupts episode. Moving on, a maskable interrupt can only happen when enabled, so to do that you need to use the EI, or Enable Interrupt Instruction. It has no operands and can be called at any time to tell the Z80 to call the routine for the current mode when the interrupt pin is held low. This will take effect immediately, unless you are in the middle of servicing a non-maskable interrupt, or NMI. As the name implies, NMIs can't be prevented by software, so using EI won't change anything for them, and maskable interrupts can only interrupt regular code execution, as they are automatically disabled during NMIs. To disable maskable interrupts entirely, you can use the DI instruction, which also has no operands. You'll want to use a DI to prevent interrupts from occurring before your program is ready for them, especially if you're using interrupt mode 2. You can do a DI, set up what you need, then do an EI, and let the interrupts start coming in. The spectrum will generate a maskable interrupt at the beginning of every vertical blanking period, so a DI will effectively stop the keyboard scan that occurs every frame, or whatever processing you specified for IM2. The last instruction we have left is HALT, which will stop the Z80 from executing any more instructions until the next interrupt occurs. Once that happens, the CPU will wake up and start executing the next instruction. Since the original Spectrum didn't connect the NMI line to any built-in component, if maskable interrupts are disabled, a halt will stop a standard specy until the power is cycled. During a halt, the Z80 doesn't shut down into any low power mode, but just keeps running as if it keeps fetching no ops and keeps the memory refreshed so that the complete machine state is preserved until the interrupt. We'll get into all of that interrupt stuff in depth another time, 
So this episode's example program is going to focus on those earlier instructions, which will allow us to do a decimal addition and then search the code for the placement of some NOOPs. Let's get into the code right now. As usual, we start our assembly code file by specifying the 48K spectrum as our target machine and beginning our code at hex 8000. We don't have any global data, so we just go right to our first instructions, which are the standard exchange and push to preserve the alternate HL register to make it possible to return a basic cleanly after the program finishes. Then we have a no-up, which will have no effect other than burning a microsecond before moving on to the next instruction. Then we load up HL and BC with some binary coded decimal numbers, so the hex 3657 will be interpreted as 3657 rather than its binary value, which would be significantly higher. And the same goes for 2845. We want to do a decimal addition rather than a binary addition, which we could do with a simple add HLBC. But the resulting hex value in HL would be 5E9C, which is certainly nothing like a decimal value. To get the decimal sum, we need to add one byte at a time and use DAA to adjust the sums. So we load L into A and then add C, which will add up the tens and ones decimal places. But still, we have a binary result. A DAA will convert that into the decimal digits we'd expect for those places, and then we can move on to the higher places. First, we store the lower byte into L for later, then load H into A and add B with the carry state that came out of the earlier edition. Another DAA will give us the correct BCD thousands and hundreds digits in A, which we then load back into H so that HL now contains the complete decimal sum. Those upper two digits are still in A, so we call the print hex routine to print them, and we'll see how that works later. Then we load L into A and print out the lower two digits, and then on the screen we should see the actual decimal sum. To move the cursor to the next line, we print out an enter code using the ROM routine at hex 10. Now let's see how we can do some linear searches. First for that no-op we put in the code earlier. We load the starting address into HL, which will be the very start of the code. Then we load BC with the size of the main routine in bytes. We let the assembler calculate this by taking the label of the next routine, print hex, and subtracting the start address from that. Finally, we load 0 into A, and that's the opcode for no op, and then CPIR to start our search. After that, HL will be pointing to the instruction after the first no op, so we decrement it to get the actual address of the no op. Then we use a couple calls to print hex to print out that hex address on the screen and then another new line. Now we want to find the last no-op in this same part of memory. So we set up HL with the address of the last byte of the main routine, which we also let the assembler calculate by subtracting one from the address of print hex. Then we set up BC and A the same as last time, but now we use CPDR to start searching backwards from the end. After that, we increment HL to get it back to the no-op address and print that out, followed by one last new line. Then you can see that we have one more no-op, and that's the one that's going to be found with the CPDR. So we see what that address is on the screen at runtime. Then we finish the main routine by restoring the alternate HL and returning. Now let's take a look at print hex, which will print out the hex digits in A. First we push A and the flags onto the stack to save the value for later. Then we shift the upper nibble four bits to the right and put that hex digit in the lower nibble. Then we call print hex digit to print that digit, and we can move on to the original lower nibble. To get that, we pop A back off the stack and use AND to zero out the upper nibble before calling print hex digit one more time and return. For print hex digit, we are expecting the upper nibble to be zeroed out, and then we can convert the digit in the lower nibble into a character code and print it out. The digit could be a decimal numeral or a letter, so first we need to compare it to hex A to see if it's going to be a letter. If the S bit is clear, we jump ahead to print letter. Otherwise, we continue to convert the value to a numeric character, which we can do by ORing it with hex 30, as that's the code for the zero character, and the rest of the numeric characters have the same offset. Then we jump ahead to print character. 
If we jump to print letter earlier, we instead add hex 37, which will convert it to a letter character code. Then we continue on to print character, where we call the ROM routine to print the code in A, and we return. We'll deploy this code by generating a snapshot named rest.sna, and to do this, we have a build script. We just call sjasm plus with the LST option to generate a machine code listing, and then pass it the name of our assembly file, rest.asm. Now let's go to the terminal and run it. We run build.sh and do a directory listing and see that the rest.sna snapshot file is there. So let's load it into the emulator. We're using Fuse again, so we hit F3 and select rest.sna and let it run. Then we see three words printed on the screen. The first is the decimal sum of 3,657 and 2,845, and we can see that the adjustments and carries from digit to digit all worked correctly. Then we have the hex addresses of the first and last no-ops in the main routine, which we can verify by going back to our machine code listing. Here we can see the first no-op address is indeed 8002, and scrolling down, we can see that the last one is 8047. So that's all we have for this odd little appendage of our series. Now we have the complete Z80 instruction set at our command, and we are ready to start exploring how to use it in more advanced ways, and exploit the humble specy to get the most out of it that we can. In the linked GitHub repo, you'll find not only this code, but all of the code examples for each lesson, and all the slides presented in this series. In the README, you'll also find links to some additional materials that can help explain what's going on and provide some needed background in case your programming experience is a bit limited. Please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to be notified when the next episode comes out. And please like this video if you learned anything, and let YouTube know that you want to see more tutorials like this. If you can't wait for the next episode to go public, join our Patreon community and see my videos ad-free as soon as they are uploaded, just like the people you see here. Thanks for watching, and I hope to see you again soon. Bye-bye.